Okay. Um, just pasting the what do you call it? I haven't got the thingy. Um, loading up. Oh, Um, where's this one? Oh, yep, yeah, no, there we go. Um, so, okay, so what's up? Um, I guess I didn't, uh, oh, that was something I meant to add. Um, so I didn't end up doing a lot of what I planned to do this weekend. Um, including spending much time on the learning report stuff. Um, um, yeah, so I didn't write sort of as much as I'd planned to. I'd written like a few things as like notes and stuff um, and starting some ideas, but I didn't really make too much progress there. So I was a bit like unhappy about that. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I did. Otherwise, um, I didn't end up getting, I mean, one of the reasons for that, so, I mean, the general sort of pattern I've identified, I think, is that I'll have stuff to do, and particularly when I feel like I've got a lot to do, um, and, like, I'd have to spend, like, for example, like, my whole weekend doing stuff, um, and not, like, uh, relaxing type thing, quote-unquote, um, then I end up, like, avoiding doing everything, almost. Um, yeah, that's uh, common. yeah, um, anyway, in this case, I, I mean, I often like sort of, uh, justify it to myself as such, um, by, uh, like doing something else that's somewhat useful, but not particularly useful. So like I spent some time coding this weekend and, uh, like did some more Haskell stuff, which I've been meaning to get back into, um, uh, got a like world record in a not very heavily heavily contested speedrun category thing for well not that the game isn't heavily contested there's only really one category um and then like did a bunch of work on that um yeah so there's like some useful stuff but it's not like you know it's not really getting me any closer to bigger goals um yeah, that's a, a really common procrastination thing where people do the sort of second most important thing or the second least bad or something. Yeah. So um, you just need one like really, really big goal and then you can procrastinate by doing all your other goals. <laughs> so I should just, um, yeah, aim for world domination and then everything else will be easy. But I don't actually yeah. need to, yeah. Um, yeah, I sort of, I mean, <laughs> it's one of those, I think the, like, the big issue that I end up getting with that is then I feel a lot worse about, because um, I do have like big goals, right? Um, I end up feeling a lot worse about other stuff or my ability to do other stuff or whatever else. Um, and that I, yeah, I guess I, um, I dislike, um, anyway, so I've been thinking a bit about that. And then, uh, some of the conversation over the weekend in, um, discord about, uh, Alan Carr's easy way to stop smoking and like habits in general, um, has sort of, I don't know. I think like, uh, I need to read it again. It's not that the conversation itself sort of like helped me in any particular way besides uh yeah, identify or you know, Read figuring the out that I'm the conversation I again or the book? Oh the book. Okay. Um particularly I had um let me see if I can find it. Uh um so I'm not sure if I can make this bigger. Yeah, there we go, good. Um uh, where was it? So we were talking about some some stuff, but the easy way stuff. I mean, I I realized that I couldn't remember it as well as I. I mean, it's like six years ago that I read it. Um, but I couldn't remember it as well as I thought I could. And I mean, I made a comment to uh that Justin replied. Where was it? Um. Uh, there was about uh stuff like not being able to apply it as well to like non-smoking things and like obviously the book is about that but um i feel like i should probably read it again because my ability to like use the knowledge is going to be pretty diminished um yeah books yeah. 
usually are not remembered very well after a few weeks or a few months or whatever. And the main thing to do is have discussions about them where you actually refer to the specific text in the book. Like you go find passages and talk about them. If you have a lot of discussions where you're actually using book passages, um, you know, that'll help memory a lot. As well as um, it can just be journaling or something where you're actually double checking what the book said using quotes. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, I definitely noticed that um, I'm a lot better at um, remembering stuff with when I take those sort of like, uh, yeah, take notes or discussing it. Um, even just like the thinking about it at the time, um, like I think one of the, I yeah. mean, it's, it's like with, I remember a lot of BOI. Um, I think like a lot more than people might usually do, um, partially because of how I read it, but I also have gone back and read, you know, bits of it um, multiple times over, you know, multiple years. Um, but yeah, as opposed to like Easy Way, I read it once all the way through. It's an easy book, so you don't have to, you know, spend lots of time thinking about it. Um, and it does a lot of the thinking for you. It just sort of gives you a lot of these uh, sort of, or walks you through the answers. Um, that's actually one thing that I like, because I've been thinking about the process of learning a lot, um, or I've been thinking about it like long term of a like the period where we've been doing these tutorials, um, and there's still like some conflicts I think with things you think and things I think, or things that like uh, sorry that's not the right way to say it, um, like the two sides of my thinking about it, um, and like one of them is to do with how like. Uh, going through the process of figuring things out when you're a bit more blind as opposed to being guided. Because um, I have an intuition about this being like good, but I can't argue for it in the sense that what's good about like making mistakes that other people know how to solve or like, you know, getting hung up on things that other people know, other people can tell you how to like get past. Um, but I think the the only like thing I've got in favor of it is that like having to do more creative work to come up with a solution uh, means that essentially you just think about it more, which means you remember it better. Um, but you're also like somewhat error prone in that creation. So it's probably good to read what everyone had to say afterwards. Um, better for stuff yeah. like maths where, where there's a definite outcome. I think there's a really common issue where people read stuff and they're like, yeah, I agree with that. And then they read more stuff and then they nod and then they read more stuff and then they nod and they don't learn much. And if you actually try to think about things yourself and solve the problems yourself, and then you read answers after you've already worked on the problem and seen how it's difficult and come up with some partial solutions and so on, uh, it's a lot more sticky and it's easier to, to actually learn something because you understand the problem situation a lot better and like what sort of traits the solution needs to have and how it would actually be used and so on. And so all that extra engagement makes a big difference. Yep. Um, that reminds me a bit of, um, watched a short video on Avogadro's number over the weekend. Um, and it's because it's a thing that people often get stuck on, like, what the hell is this? Um, the guy who explained it, Steve Mould, was explaining it in terms of the problem that it solved, um, which is just simplifying the logic around chemical equations by abstracting out uh, like masses into number of molecules um but particularly it's like that like knowing what problem something solves or why you're going to do something um i think is like really crucial and that's something that you often don't get yourself like you might have a parochial problem that something solves but if the solution is like general um understanding the wider sort of context and what everyone else is looking for the solution or why everyone else is looking for the solution is like yeah really really helpful both in understanding it and then yeah remembering it um, yeah, so, but that occurred to me at the time as like a good example of, or as simple example, I guess, of, of, uh, yeah, how that stuff plays together, um, it relates to, you know, like people learning maths, often they get an explanationless version, which is pretty crap. Um, and so they do badly at it. Yeah. So one of the sort of models of ideal learning is, uh, people have interests and they pursue their own interests and projects. And then they look stuff up when they run into trouble. And it's very like targeted reading at specific problems they're currently facing. And 
this has a variety of upsides like you actually use the stuff you read and you know what it's for and you're sort of guiding your own learning there are also some uh, disadvantages or difficulties with that so when you just like read a book and it tells you here are the problems in the field and the answers it's much easier to be passive but there are some upsides like you can get an organized take on what humanity already knows um, it's often like a lot better than what you would invent on your own it can be a lot yeah. more complete and organized and um, error checked and so on Whereas if you're just looking up little bits and pieces as you go along, uh, it's easy for your big picture to be chaos and wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, and, that's, yeah. You, sorry, go on. Yeah, the other problem with, with the follow your interest thing is a lot of times people have bad interests due to static memes or whatever. Like, interests are not necessarily actually good ideas, and people are not very good at evaluating and controlling and changing their interests yeah um well i think a lot of people have the belief that they can't um i think actually like that belief in general seems to be sort of i don't know i'm not sure if it's just a parochial misconception but it seems to be like epistemically important in that it informs like whether you look for ideas a lot of the time um and so if people believe that they can't do something or they're not that type of person or whatever else uh then they've like automatically excluded a huge sort of like uh set of ideas or set of um not just about themselves but about topics and knowledge and whatever else um which is really limiting but yeah so the reason it seems epistemically important is that it changes the like process of coming up with ideas or like what ideas you can find um but i think that's sort of like in many ways just a a thing that happens because we're people and we're looking at it from that perspective unfortunately it's pretty easy to go wrong both ways with more of the self-guided learning or the the following the standard path learning mm. like it, yeah it's pretty easy for either one to not work out very well i think roughly what people should do is start with primarily the guided learning as children um always a mix but more more guided the less you know and then as you catch up on standard knowledge you have more of the tools to to go do your own thing and more context to fit it into yep Um, so just to note, I changed, um, keyboards, uh, like not just like cleaned my old keyboard or whatever. Um, I started having an issue with the control key, um, and it's a cheap, like mechanical keyboard. Um, anyway, uh, I haven't sp like, you know, I changed it right before the tutorial, but, um, just noticing typing like this here, um, it's like a lot nicer and better. I feel like I'm, uh, yeah, just able to type faster by changing the thing, making fewer errors. Um, yeah, on a related note, I only like to type on Apple keyboards. Um, the the chiclet style ones, like laptop keys instead of full height keys, I've used those like pretty exclusively for a long time, and I strongly prefer them. Yeah, um, I sort of do too. Um, I've got uh, like an old keyboard here that has some issues. Well, it's not that old, um, but it's a it's a mechanical keyboard, but like thin profile. And I really, really like it. Um, uh, and it's just dirty. I need to clean it. So there's a few issues with the keys. Um, but yeah, but I do find like the travel distance of mechanical keyboards is sometimes nice, but um, it's yeah, nowhere near as sort of agile, I guess, as um, yeah, the laptop style keyboards. Um, I quite like Apple's Apple keyboards when they work as well. I actually really liked the butterfly keyboards besides the issues they had like long-term issues but i thought they were really nice to type on yeah i i don't think they were as nice as apple's regular external full-size keyboards but they were mm. fine when they didn't break yeah um yeah okay so i um i just before the 
uh, what do you call it, before the session this morning, I was typing up some of this. Um, I'm not sure there's really that much to talk about in regards to, like, I mean, I spent a bunch of time on this because I I did like the, what do you call it, the world record thing um, or the speed run. Like, I did it with, like, thinking about a lot of the stuff you've said about speed runs and then, and things like learning in general, um, which I thought was sort of interesting in that I my method was quite different from what I normally would have done. Um, uh, what did you do differently? So uh, normally I think I, so I did, I just to gauge my own interest for it, I did like a casual run through first, um, which went pretty well. Um, but particularly I uh, wanted to, so I, I needed to like evaluate what had, what had been done previously. Um, and so the first thing that I tried to do before even like actually attempting to run, like, you know, replicate anyone's runs um, was to get a image of the map so that I could like draw out the path that people took. Um, and so uh, I figured out how to do that because the game was in Unity, that made it fairly easy. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, I saw your run really quickly and I saw the map at the end and paused on the map. Yeah, that's why I put it in there because I didn't want to like, you know, include too much, but I wanted it like because there wasn't any resources. So if someone else wanted to run, at least that would give them a basic idea. Um, yeah. FYI, if you're going to do that, you should um, record it longer. The map's only there for like a second or two. And I kept having the video go to the end screen because you, YouTube won't oh, yeah. show you the last frame if you go past the end. So I had to um, slow the video speed down to 1x and then rewind and then, then I was able to pause fast enough. When I was at like 3x, I couldn't actually pause on the map screen after a couple tries. Oh yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, uh, I did actually, so I, I'm not sure um, when you saw it, but I did add, oh no, when I made it public, I added, um, what do you call it, links in the description to, um, like not the full maps that I've made in Illustrator, but just the like screenshots and stuff that I took. Um, so this was just like a screenshot from inside the Unity engine, but it's, you know, it's obviously enough to get all the info that's needed. Um, yeah. Uh, it is It is actually part of a longer video, like I recorded several hours um, that evening, more. Um, I actually forgot to record, like the first time I beat, <laughs> um, I got like a 235 and I forgot to record it. So I had to, um, yeah, go do that again. But um, uh, yeah, no, I've got several hours of all that and I've got a lot of my process recorded as well because I thought it might be like interesting later or whatever else. I'm not sure there's really that much there. Um, one thing yeah, I, I was actually though, confused yep. because your splits were at like minus seven on your world record video. Mm. Like you had lost time. Some some of best times versus yeah. Um, that's I thought best. it might be that. Um, so that I'm, means the like, the record's not super optimal. No, no, no. Well, I mean, even in the run, like there was there's at least like five seconds I reckon I could save just from the run without any other improvements, just mechanically. Um, right. Yeah. The, okay. The timing, um, one of the things about the timing um, was that I, I, I spent, uh, so I, I wasn't really, sh so I, first I had more splits to start with, which was just painful, um, like there were too many. Um, and the other yeah. thing that I had a lot of trouble with was actually That game doesn't like... have uh, cutscenes to split during? Yeah. Um, the other thing was that I had uh, a bunch of trouble, yeah, so now, now it's showing my personal best, I think. Um, uh, I had a lot of trouble activating it without, uh, like interrupting stuff. So I tried like the space, space bar for one of them. Anyway, I ended up settling on mouse three, like the back button on the side of my mouse. Oops. I don't know if I can pull it up enough to show you. Yeah. But, um, anyway, that, that worked really well. Um, and then I've just got to remember to enable and disable hotkeys in auto split. But, um, but yeah, so it was good that I captured one where I didn't bugger that up. But that, that sort of like of the 31 attempts that it says up here, Probably ten of those are just false positives because I've had to like I've accidentally started and restarted, had to stuff like that. Right, right. Um, but yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. One of the things that I did do though was um, uh, was to map out the uh, the lengths of, of all the stuff. So it was like get a copy of the map, um, transcribe as such everyone else's routes. Um, and that immediately helped. There were like two, two or three optimizations that I found just by looking at the map, which I presume people hadn't done before. Um, yeah, I looked at the map and I wasn't sure about a couple of your route things. I don't know if you want to talk about that. 
Oh yeah, no, I wouldn't mind. Um, okay. Is yeah. The first one was the start. So this depends. I I don't know the game, so I don't know how fast you can turn. Oh. So but one thing I, that's. I thought if you could turn really fast, it'd be better to skip that one and like get it while going through the middle. So if you watch my actual run, so the thing about you'll see, like um, at the eighty six at the end there, it says two twenty five. Um, uh, that if I had that time, I wouldn't be able to. So this is the previous world record one, not my run. Um, so I changed that, uh, like at the start. So in the in the start of my one, you see that I just skip it. Um, and that saves like a second. Um, it's a oh, really okay. big time save because um, you come back exactly via that path. So why go out of your way? the The main penalty is changing velocity. Um, you've got like a lot of inertia. Yeah. So you go left. You go straight to the left first. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. So I was right about that one. I just wasn't sure if you could turn fast enough because if you're like slow to turn, uh, then it wouldn't work. Turning, you've got no restriction on how fast you you turn the camera, but your change of velocity takes a long time. So that's why you see, like you see like it's really slow to slow down or stuff like that occasionally, or like where where I'll like miss one and then it ah, takes you know so like if a you're second currently stopped, you can turn really fast. Uh, you can rotate the camera as fast as you want at any point. It's just you keep moving in the same direction. It's like right. um like flying a spaceship type thing. Yeah. So if you're currently stopped, like at the beginning. Then you can turn really fast, and then just start in whatever direction you want. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, I so, was also from... wondering about this part, because going um, going down and straight back the same line is inefficient. Yes. So I thought it um, might be better to grab those from, like, this loop. Might be more efficient so, place to grab them later. Um, yeah, the... Uh, one of the things about that is your like um, whoops, sorry I'm. Um, so in where's Illustrator gone? Um. So yeah, so in, uh, this bit. So when you're um, I need to make sure I select the color. I don't know how like, Illustrator started being annoying and not, doing things well. Just even. All right. Hopefully this will. All right. Um, this is a pain. Um, the so you've got a lot of velocity in this section here, sort of coming up. So you get like a lot of velocity there. So you need to. It's really hard to. So even just turning around like that, like you can't. It's not like a plane where, um, you can, uh, bank more quickly the faster you're going. Um, so you need to shed a lot of that velocity to get back to these because there's no other. Um, there's no convenient way to do that. Oh, so you're saying you're coming up. along here, and it's actually hard to make this turn. So you need the stopping distance anyways? Yeah. And then oh, as okay. you're... That makes sense. When in the pink bit that I've got there, that loop around the mushroom, um, uh, the you so we get a lot of velocity coming through the bottom track there. And so I picked yeah. up that, uh, that extra one where the pink... Uh, like has a crux there, um, which then saved a whole bunch of time because the other guy makes two like about turns. Like he comes through, gets the the one at the green. Oh, yeah, index, yeah. He gets sort of and all the way again, back, and it's really awkward yeah. to go like this. Yeah. Then you've Instead got yeah. Two, like, so in terms of the round. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um. um so. Yeah, so that was like another improvement that probably saved um, on the order of like half a second to a second. Um, he goes and gets a whole bunch of them as well, but getting two or three at that blue bit where where we turn around um, makes it like significantly easier to then uh, take the path later on. Um, the top part on the top right is a bit of a mess um, because there's a lot around there with a lot of changes. When you're not going that fast though, you have more flexibility in like taking zigzag sort of routes right yeah um so that part's like not perfect i think i actually ended up skipping some of those in the in the like fast run i did like accidentally skipping them i missed them and then kept going because to stop and go back would be too much and i knew i'd be coming back there um 
Right. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't sure this area was perfect, but it's hard to tell exactly. Um, oh no, it was it was far from. Um it's also yeah, I mean it's hard to there was there was once where I got like pretty close to the two thirty um and missed one of those that I didn't realize. They're just, they're really easy to miss if you're not um looking out for them and hearing for the sound cue of picking them up. Um, which then obviously kills the run, but yeah. Yeah. Drawing um, the thing out is nice though, that helps a lot with figuring out what to do. Yeah, yep. Well, one thing that's nice about it as well that I realized, so I thought you you can see the purple square um, there just above your mouse cursor. Um, so I considered what would it be like to, instead of going and getting those two groups of three initially, just going straight for the donut and then coming back to them. Um, it makes it pretty obvious drawn out like this though, that there's very little, if any, potential benefit because you've still got to take the four sides of that square, essentially. Um, because yeah. you want to come and you want to around leave the... in, in this direction. Yeah, exactly. Not and in so, that direction. Um, yeah, so you have to come around that light gray uh, rock there on the left hand side. Um, sorry, I'm, it's probably easier for me to bring up like this so you can see what I'm uh, looking at at the same time as you are. Um, I'll put it on the left hand side of the screen so you can have the video up. But that way it just. Um... Oh, this might just. Uh, all right, I don't know. We'll <laughs> let it settle. But this is one of the. Uh, all right, I'm just getting rid of it. Um, anyway, yeah. On the. Um, yeah. Um, that's like the main sort of difficulty. I initially tried to have a really, uh, sort of loopy route where you could go fast the entire time. Um, yeah. And like that was that was this one. Um, oh yeah. So I mapped out the distances of each thing as well. Um, so this was like just a time that the guy set initially um, for the first run, like six months ago or whenever it was, um, which I actually like, I beat that on my first casual attempt of going fast. I played the game like multiple times a few years ago, um, but um, B, I tried it just like the other night and got 404. So it's pretty, pretty easy to beat that. Um, uh, yep. Um, Anyway, but mapping out the distances was, uh, this is a straight line distance, not curved, but, um, but yeah, sort of shows that there's like significant uh, relationships between the distance and, uh, yeah, the end time at, even still. But my, you know, loopy route was longer than the initial one, um, but I was able to do it like nearly a minute faster. So there might be some potential stuff there. I'm not really convinced. It's too um you sort of always have to end at this thing on the top there because they're pretty much in a row and you end in a corner where like where you come in that gate is the only place to come into that uh like fenced area. Right. So yeah, it's this bit... this also seems like something you could simulate with a computer and have it find a route for you. Um which is well I bring up another one. Um, so I started trying to do that, um, and I ran into some problems, um, multiple different problems. Um, I didn't get anything sensible out of it, but I've got a Python and a Haskell implementation. Um, so um, yeah, the idea is that thing that uh, in the Imga thing that I linked to um, uh, in the YouTube description, the middle image, uh, which might just look all black, is actually a transparent uh, overlay um, with, uh, oh, actually, I can show you here. I think, yeah, so it's this, which is what I processed to do, um, uh, yeah, to like, um, it's just walls and stuff you can't move through. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, um, I actually have some notes about that in, um, uh, where is it? The learning report. Um, because I ended up running into, there was a few things that just weren't very good because I was like tired and stuff when I was doing some of it. Um, but in terms of actual like issues, um, there's, 
so one of the big issues is just having a big image is slow with like any uh, route finding stuff. So needing to like scale that down, um, that's pretty straightforward. But then there's you know just more subtleties there. A um, uh, big one is that the like image library I'm using in Haskell is super slow to do lookups um, or like testing pixels. And I didn't have this problem in Python. Um, the reason in Python is just that the like you uh, like there's just a there's a science library called Numpy that uh, does really efficient like arrays and lookups and stuff like that. Um, whereas with Haskell, you've got to like specify uh, in the type system the sort of like you can you can have it be like a list or a vector or arrays or sequences or ropes or all kinds of crap. Um, and if you don't like particularly tell the compiler which one to use, then uh, it'll probably end up using a list or um, you know, if you use list elsewhere, it'll end up using that. So it's uh, potentially really slow. But like, just yeah. looping over all of the pixels in that image, like a million pixels, to test whether they were black or white, um, took like 60 seconds in my test, um, which is just way too long. So the Haskell one just doesn't do anything uh, useful at the moment. Um, it does have a pretty. Yeah. You could probably just load them in and save um, some shape boundaries and approximate them a little bit, and then it would be fast. Um, the so I wanted to try. I didn't want to end up writing any machine learning algs uh, like you know from scratch or anything. So I was restricting myself to using what I could find. Um, uh, just because it's another place for bugs and stuff. Um, the A star implementation in there are actually two, but the one I was using from Haskell libraries, um, uh, like it needs neighbors. And so I need some kind of grid anyway. Um, if I used a vector thing though, that would actually make it a lot easier to um, to test. I ran into a problem where when I made it too small, the boundaries that I drew in Photoshop ended up getting, uh, like there would be like a diagonal, like a chessboard where um, you'd have like a diagonal line in the black, but if you could move, like if the algorithm allowed you to move diagonally, you could skip from two white squares across it. Um, yeah, I see. Um, yeah. Whereas, yeah. The other thing I was going to say is it sounds like you were sort of looking for a mathematical solution, whereas my first thought would be to use like a game playing bot with like an evolutionary algorithm or reinforcement learning or something. Oh, yeah, so it is more like an exhaustive search or... Um, it's not an exhaustive search. It's a... um. Because you can basically just have a bot press buttons and see what score it gets, and then try again. Which um, is a different approach than using things like pathfinding. Um, yeah, I'm looking for a function called evolve. Um, anyway, there is one. Um, yeah, so this is a this is an evolutionary algorithm. Um, it's not fast. Um, in that looking at evolutionary solutions to traveling salesmen. Um, seems to be pretty slow um something like a neural net might do better but it has less information about the route like you'd need to watch it to see how it performs um whereas this just spits out the route at the end that's what it's searching through um yeah i knew that an exhaustive search would be too much um there's a whole bunch of other optimizations that i've thought of as well like trying to uh like in the map you can see that like there's various fenced areas um, yeah. uh, the issue that I wanted to solve with the, like the boundary stuff and like a star is that, uh, just doing a, you know, distance thing doesn't work. You need to figure out like what the longer distance is, um, uh, going around corners and stuff. Uh, anyway, if we had like, like if there were like boundary nodes that you had to go through, um, like at gates and stuff, that might be a way to solve it without doing too much of that. Um, another thing you could do yeah. is manually link the nodes and turn them into a graph and only do links that you think are worth considering, and then yes. let it optimize from there. Yep. So, for example, like um, all of those things in a run, um, like the right. 14 things in a row at the end, like linking all those because it doesn't, it's still, yeah. it's always going to find those being in order. There's no more optimal way of doing it. Um, right. Yeah. That I would limit I was... the search space a lot if you had, like, these were all a group, and these were all a group, and so on. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, uh, I mean, those two are safe because there's no way to really get any better there. The middle ones aren't though, because they're all like, they're already broken up, um, in the route. Um, 
Yeah, so you would you'd have like a few extra links. You'd link them like this, and then you'd also like have like a few divergence points as options, kind of. Yeah, um, and it'd still not be that many possible links. My initial like goal with the like the methodology I was looking at was to uh, bias CPU time over brain time sort of thing like there's lots of yeah. custom so unless i ran into like particular issues i feel like it would be um uh yeah the less time i need to spend trying to do manual stuff because every every like manual uh uh like alteration you make or like optimization like that um like exponentially increases the complexity of the algorithm um just in terms of bugs and logical errors yeah. and stuff like that another thing you could try is just um have it only go to a, a node within a certain distance and ignore everything further away. Like a search, I mean, pruning limit thing. That would be generic. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the ways that... Um, it doesn't have to consider going from, like, there to there. That's true. I mean, that would eliminate most of the things. I'm just wondering whether there's any times... What's the furthest that we go between uh, between nodes? So I mean, like, um, for example, in the, uh, like, after we get this node here, um, yeah, there's other ways you can do it. Like, um, after you get to a node, find the closest node, and then only consider nodes that are that distance plus like twenty percent, or plus fifty percent, or whatever. Yeah. Um. But yeah, these ones then go to like there. Oh, that's not what I meant to do, but okay. Um, anyway, yeah, it's um, um, yeah. There's a few things like that. I guess I um, I sort of figured that an evolutionary algorithm should try and like uh, not make too many mistakes like that. Like it should optimize away pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I found it, it might do that depending. Um, I found that because of the number of, like, there's 100 orbs to collect, uh, it's pretty slow. Um, even still, like, 2,000 generations on, um, uh, didn't really get anywhere particularly fast. Um, I yeah. preloaded... Is your algorithm the... taking into account momentum, or is it just, like, finding a no, route? No, no. Uh, no, it's just see, finding a route. That's what I was thinking initially, with more of a game playing bot that just presses buttons and sees what happens. Is that it, you could simulate the momentum part because that's part of the the difficulty of it. Um. Yeah, I figured that if I, well, that I might do it if it was worthwhile. But um, uh, but again, that's I mean the I feel like I'd probably need to implement half the like a or half of a simple game engine to do it sort of thing. Um. In yeah, I mean a, a two as a two D I... game without the graphics. And yeah, yeah, walls yeah. and things you pick up and one thing that moves around that's pretty easy to, to implement but yeah it's, it's extra stuff to do it's yeah i mean it's reasonably easy to like there's nothing particularly challenging about it but it i imagine it would take a decent amount of time um like i could easily spend or see spending like you know i don't know a day plus on something like that depending on what i was trying to do um, yeah yeah that's possible yeah it might not be worth it at all um yeah but i did um there were a few things that i really should have like a few mistakes i made that i really shouldn't have um like um one of the optimizations i got like a csv of um points what did i oh this just shows the the what do you call it image that or you know pulling the points out um anyway i tried to rescale them to make that more optimal and ended up spending like an hour trying to debug issues that were just because I was using like um the image that I was using for the A star algorithm uh hadn't been adjusted, like hadn't been uh scaled X and Y like the points had. That was scale, that was offset um scale I was doing. But yeah. Yeah. There's like there was a few things that were silly like that. Um but yeah. But I at least know where the bottleneck is at the moment because the algorithm's quite slow to run. I'll it actually came with, like, I found something online that came with a, um, uh, 
what do you call um OpenGL output? Um and uh with my yeah A star implementation it was uh like really, really, really slow. Um like you know, one frame per five hours or something other. Um I'm just uh what do you call it? Breaking the or removing that distance thing to um show it because it should be pretty quick. Um but yeah. Uh so it yeah. I'm not really convinced that I've that it was worth it to get this far, but I'm fairly close to letting like being able to just let it run for some time. Um so that's nice at least. Yeah. I, I tend to avoid programming projects for a while now. Other stuff to do. Well, that's so. This is sort of relating to what I mentioned at the beginning. Um, yeah. Like I'm, I'm finding more and more that I don't, or it's not that I don't enjoy coding like I used to as such. It's that I, like, am enjoying other things, and I, like, other things. Um, like uh, philosophy, like the like organizational stuff with Flux, whatever else. Um, uh, like there's a tendency to get stuck on things that are coding related because they're, I don't know, easiest. Like don't require as much like thinking. Maybe it's it's a weird thing to say that, um, you know, I prefer doing programming stuff because it requires less thinking. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of I've been thinking about that a bit recently, and that it feels. Feels like there's, I don't know, some conflicts type there. Something like that. Regarding it's reading weird. and fabric, I often read two books at once, like a harder one and an easier one. So that okay, I can I... adjust more to the situation. I'm somewhat skeptical. Like, what I feel like happens a lot of the time with that is that I will... Um, I will end up, uh, like the more that it's, it's, uh, well, it's sort of like games. Like if I start playing one video game and then I start playing another video game, I drop the first one. And I feel like with books, that's a bit of an issue as well. And it's one of the like contributing factors to like not having continued to go through the choice. Um, right. For example. I see. Yeah. There's also value in just lowering your standards a little bit and being willing to read it when you're not full attention or whatever. And just yeah. go through it and say this is a lot better than not reading it. I'll just try to get 70% of the value with 25% of the effort or whatever. And call it good enough. Yeah. Um, part of the... Like, this then triggers a second thing where I... Uh, like... I don't know. I feel like in part that is to do like one of the reasons I don't like doing that is that it feels cheaper maybe or uh like I'm not getting everything I can out of the book like if I did that with the choice which is sort of I mean there was I was already running into like blockers in terms of um uh like you know comparing analysis to um frats notes and stuff uh I don't know it sort of it sort of feels like just completing it for the sake of it but i i mean it's they're, they're books that i still value like i still think there's going to be knowledge in there so half asking yeah. it feels like a waste of time if that makes sense i don't know i don't yeah. think it's a waste of time because then you actually get through it and you get to start benefiting somewhat and you can always go back to them later if you think it's worth it yeah um i don't know i guess it feels less efficient or less I think it often yeah. leads to to reading more and ends up more efficient overall. So yeah, I wonder if this is like my learning thing. Oh, so this is the um this is the thing by the way. Um, oh, I see. So just with a with that a looks silly very um scattered, like it's just going all over the place unreasonably. Um. Oh yeah, I started from a random distribution. Um. It, there's a, there is a nearest neighbor starting point as well. Um. But I thought that might bias it and not let it find various solutions. Um, I see. 
the the thing with this though is it's just that there's no walls in this like the distance algorithm will just um right. yeah we'll just uh do a regular pythagorean thing um it starts in future by the way and ends in bluish wherever that is um yeah um just that's just what the colors mean so um but this is way way faster than like python just doing this um was much much slower still so it is faster but yeah anyway i'll let it run maybe we can see what it figures out in an hour um anyway um yeah, yeah, generally, I think with the best books, you should expect that you will end up reading them at least twice. And if it's not worth two readings, it's not that huge of a deal. And yeah. maybe that'll enable you to be less concerned about your first reading. Yeah, um, I think part of it is... So maybe it's... So one thing that occurs to me about that is I think a lot of people would not like the idea of doing a second reading. Um, sort of like, you know, watching a film for the second time, unless you're interested in like analyzing it or something, I don't think a lot of people will enjoy that. Um, maybe specific films, but not generally. Um, yeah, I think people are wrong about that. And there's something about like novelty maybe involved. And um, it's very, very common that young children watch the same films many, many times, which I, I think is an indicator as well. And then people stop doing it and they're like, oh, it's boring. I think yeah. part of, I think a lot of why they don't want to watch the same one again is they watch in a passive way. And if you're passive, it's the same twice, so it's boring. Whereas if you're watching in an active way, then it changes as you change. If you get a new perspective, then watching it's a different experience the second time. Yeah. Um, one of the big things that occurs to me just now about that is so I often watch something after i've like watched like a 40 minute analysis of it on youtube um so a good example of this actually um is uh there was a video or there's there's a guy that i've found um let me see if i can find him real quick um, um so yeah so uh this guy jesse tribble um has uh, just finished publishing so I found them just after it published the third one, I think. Um, but like, uh, these are all like 40 minute or on average 40 minute long um, sort of analysis videos about right. House particularly. Um, but he had, uh, like, I think- Are I they about two... plot or about medicine and science? Uh, so uh, plot, so not exactly plot, um, that comes into it, but uh, like they're from a he's like a filmmaker type thing or studying to be a filmmaker so they're from a general okay, yeah. sort of, Got it. that side of things um so i mean he talks about like color in parts um plot and pacing and stuff are a big part of it like um he talks a bit about how he thinks it should have ended with the first episode of season six um where house goes into a mental place for it's a super long episode um but um but i watched both you were never really there and uh, John Don, that should be here somewhere. Um, these aren't super long, um, but only after, uh, yeah, here we go, two years ago. So this is, yeah, John Don is like 20 minutes um, long. Uh, and then You Were Never Really the Joker is basically a, uh, he's, he's reviewing You Were Never Really There as though it were the film Joker instead of like actually the film Joker. Um, it was like 18 months later, but they both had Joaquin Phoenix. So it sort of uh, was a bit clever. Um, but yeah, like I enjoy films more after like watching analysis of them and things, um, which I think is notable for its difference to people's usual reaction of enjoying it less after that sort of stuff. Um, and then, you know, Feynman's comments on flowers and beauty and things basically explain that, um, I think, but yeah, that's the, the yeah. passive mindset is that like, right. if you understand it, it like gets worse. Yeah, it's partly if you're passive, then the, the surprise at the end, like the plot resolution, is uh, significant to you. And you don't get that the second time, you're like, I know the ending. Whereas if you're like analyzing, then the ending isn't 
uh, it's not as important. It's a smaller piece of the whole. It's just one thing. Yeah. Um, or, I mean, you get things like, I mean, this is one of the things is, uh, so in like the analysis of John Don, um, like I knew how the ending, like what happened in the end, because it's part of the analysis and it took nothing away from the film. Um, it's like, you know, it's that thing about, are you watching it for like the journey and the ideas or for like the tension and the resolution? And if you're watching it for the tension, then the tension goes away on subsequent things. Cause you already know, uh, maybe there's some, some good like cinema, cinemagraphic tension that, um, persists because of shots and lighting and sound and stuff. But, um, but otherwise it's like, yeah, all of that goes away, but it becomes I think better or more interesting that way. Um, Anyway, People... I don't know why I don't think about this like books or books like this as opposed to films like... Oh, I see. Yeah. People also do a lot of their watching for social reasons so that they can like talk mm. about it with friends and not be left out or at the water cooler. Comes up with sports as well. And so yeah. that doesn't require rewatching, and it's a different thing than little kids are doing when they watch stuff. Yes. Yep. Um, well, that's actually why do kids rewatch stuff so much? Like they rewatch, like you know, you'll like a kid will really like The Lion King and like watch that twenty times. Um, yeah, I think the main reason is because the world is really, really, really confusing, and like adults don't respect how hard it is to figure out what the fuck is going on when you're like age five or less. Um, making sense of the world at the beginning is is really tough, and so it makes total sense to examine the same thing like 20 times while trying to figure it out before you actually get it and to, to peel back the layers and if you just keep going to the next thing after watching everything once you're just going to stay confused like you're never going to go in depth on anything and actually understand it which i think is yeah a lot of adult, adults don't want to go in depth on things and actually understand them but little kids are still trying to to make sense of the world instead of accepting confusion as the natural state yeah um i wonder if like this procrastination thing that we started out talking about is like in essence a preference for simplicity over complexity or and or confusing complexity um that's because like for the same reason as kids wanting to watch the same thing over and over um maybe adults have given up hope a bit about actually understanding it whereas kids haven't but um yeah it's sort of, I mean, and well, actually, it's also rewarding for kids to do that in that they actually are getting something out of it, potentially, as opposed to, or at least by comparison to what they could be getting out of other stuff. Um, whereas for adults, it, usually they don't really get much out of it. But it feels similar in some ways. Uh, do you yeah. want to go to these these ideas, post ideas, and talk about um, some of these? Yeah, as a interesting thing, just to talk about first, because I think I'm I'm not sure if I put it okay. in there or not. Um, but one thing that I uh, had, do I have the post mortem here? Where did I put that? Um, so I had a mini post mortem at some point. Um, uh, maybe it is. Oh yeah, no, it is in the post ideas. It's like fourth or fifth dot point down. Um, it's got some, uh, yeah, so Fabric Chapter 1, 27 to 28 minutes, page 12. Um, that was like an interesting, uh, I was surprised because I heard something that I like really didn't agree with. Like it was like, what on earth is meant here? Um, I think with this sort of stuff, uh, like definitely I do this more now uh, than in the past, but um but in the past with something like this, I think I would have done it to some extent. Like when you disagree with an author about something or you hear something and you're like, this doesn't gel or this doesn't make sense. Um, even if it's about like a complex topic. Um, but yeah, like what I heard was the idea that, you know, someone with a, with an explanation of general relativity would be able to look at planets and then say something like once they've, you know, analyzed the situation fully. Um, oh, I, uh, I realize now that there's nothing besides facts in this which aren't explained by general relativity. Um, anyway, and it's because of the way that the audiobook person decided to read the commas in that sentence. There's multiple commas. 
um, and it's not very well, I don't think it's well structured because when you read it too quickly, it sounds as though Deutsch is saying something that's instrumentalist as opposed to fallibilist. Um, whereas if you rearranged right. it, you, it would, the meaning would be clearer. Um, uh, but yeah, and basically it was just like, just checking the print copy was enough to resolve that. Um, but it's interesting that I wonder how many people, well, it's not really that interesting, but I do wonder how many people would just skip over stuff like that when they um, hear something that doesn't quite gel whether they bother thinking about it or not. Um, the other thing yeah, just on the note of the, fabric. The whole, interest, the whole issue is a little um, unusual to me because I'm used to text-to-speech much more than audiobooks. And the computer doesn't uh, misinterpret things and put its own opinions in. Um, yeah. But it's, so like, it's, uh, uh, it's confusing or missing information in its own ways. Like... Some sentences are just hard to follow in text to speech. Yeah, I you think text to speech. You have to get is, used to it. It's better though, in the sense that if there's something like queer about the way that the TTS is saying it, uh, yeah, like it, 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 it's much easier to identify when something's weird as opposed to people will try and make it sound natural, even if it's, uh, even if it is actually weird. So TTS allows you to actually figure out what the weird parts are much more easily. Yeah, TTS is super consistent, which I like. I find that useful. Yep, I agree. Um, it also means you get the same reader every single book, instead of having to yeah. deal with different readers. So it's more consistent. Um, yeah, and then I guess if people had a preference, um, I think it's bad for people to have a preference, like to, you know, not want to listen to a podcast because they don't like the voice of the speaker or stuff. Um, like I've had people complain about things I've linked them to in the past because they dislike the person presenting it. Um, uh, yeah, 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 Harry but... Benswanger <laughs> said that he refused to engage with my video because he didn't like my accent. Like, the thing that gets me is just, so I don't think I had a particular problem with it, but there was, I think it was actually a podcast from NPR um, or like This American Life. Um, in 2016 or so that I listened to where that, where it was just about, there were three of the people who like three staff um, and they were just talking about this discrimination against them. Um, so like Ira Glass was mentioning it. And then there are two women who had different, uh, there was vocal fry was one thing that apparently people hate um, particularly yeah. in women. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, something else as well. Uh, anyway, but since that point, um, I mean, an hour long podcast is a bit long, uh, you know, it's more than necessary to make the point rather is what I mean. Um, but yeah, I've been really conscious about like not doing that. And just the number of people who do it is really surprising. Um, Vocal yeah. Fry signals, um, socioeconomic status and some other things like it's, it's correlated with a lot of stuff and How... also our other language choices. So I can see like Valley girl is an easy one. Um, uh, yeah. particularly like social in group stuff. Um, what is vocal fry like? Um, how does that? Uh... It's related to certain certain subcultures like sorority girls, um, who are higher socioeconomic status. Pretty sure. I'm not an expert on the trends, but I'm pretty sure there are trends, and I, I think it's uh, it's like somewhat high socioeconomic status, but not the top. I think. Yeah, um, that's particularly, um, I don't know. It seems like something that's less, well, I, uh, I don't know. No, I was going to say like, um, men might, uh, be affected by it less because, but no, there's still like, there's a lot of preference stuff with voices or whatever else. Yeah. There's fashions. People put a huge amount of work into how they talk and how they sound. Mostly as children, and they don't remember it. But it's um like it's part of femininity to sound a certain way, and that's not just like people assume it's automatic from like girl genes or something, which certainly have some some effect. But a lot of it is people training themselves to fit into certain subcultures. No, I've definitely um done that in the past. Uh, occasionally, like really, really occasionally, once every like three years or something 
uh, like I'll have an Australian ask if I like spent time in Britain or something like that. Um, apparently, because some of the words I pronounce are similar to that, but it was because I put effort into uh, like in my teenage years, like working on enunciation and making sure that I didn't like mumble stuff or uh, yeah, or yeah. Just slur. Yeah, so judging someone by their voice is, is very similar to judging them by their shoes or their hair or whatever. It's, yep. These are ways people signal their identity and their place in society. Yep. And um, they're, they're such common signaling mechanisms that if you try to ignore them, people just judge you anyways and assume that you're doing your best and whatever. Yeah. Um... I don't know, it seems to me like, I think there's, you know, it's worth spending time, you know, making sure you can communicate and stuff, but people put a lot of effort into other things. Like, I've got a friend who's 16 or so who sounds a hell of a lot more British than I ever did, but has no reason to. Um, and I think it's just because of either the stuff he's, like, watching or listening to or things like that, and then putting effort into doing it, um, and sort of being a bit on the, yeah, on the far side. Um, But yeah, anyway, um, did, I don't know if there was, before we went through the post ideas, I was just thinking I took some notes on fabric. So I noted down anything that I didn't feel like I knew and understood. Uh, there were a few times where I, like, there were a few bits that I didn't pay as close attention to, but that's, but not 90 plus percent of it I played pretty close attention to. Um, but yeah, um, so with the exception of, I cut out a whole bunch of stuff here because I went off topic. Um, and the post-mortem thing, which is in the other thread. Um, this is pretty much all I um, wrote down. Um, I don't think that this is... There was, uh, what do you call it? A few, like, what do you call it? Side tangents of stuff I wanted to think about. But direct things, this is about it. Which I wasn't too surprised at in that it's they're establishing chapters. Um, and I've like read them before and read BOI, so I didn't think that was I wasn't going to be surprised by anything. This one um, I find a little odd, because I thought that evolution and epistemology are already unified. Knowledge, you know, the subject of epistemology, is the thing created by evolution. It's information that's adapted. Um, yeah, the reason I said this, because um, I, I thought a little bit about the wording when doing it. Um, so, when... I think they're, like related they're not really unified yet um because we don't know so for example we can say or we we you know think that ideas are generated via some evolutionary process um what are the components of ideas that our brain is doing evolution on um right so we don't know the data structure for ideas but I don't, that doesn't strike me as the fields being separate. Like, I just saw that in a, in a different way. Okay, yeah, no, I don't think they're separate. Like, um, I think, yeah, unification is maybe a bad word there. Um, and, like, um, I don't see, like, a current clash between them that would, oh, like, no, the yeah. way there's, you know, the clash between uh, quantum physics and relativity. So you have to, like, figure out how to harmonize them in order to do a, like, full unification, whereas we don't, we don't know of a, an ongoing reason that evolution and epistemology can't both be right without a change. So yeah, so I guess what I mean is like, um, like when evolution was first sort of, uh, like when Darwin was proposing it, um, we had the idea of things being passed down, but we didn't know how they were passed down. Um, and so I'd roughly say that like evolution hadn't been unified with biology at that point. Um, like how does evolution connect to, you know, any arbitrary point of uh, an animal and, you know, can we say whether there is a connection or not for any arbitrary thing? Um, Cause maybe there's not. Um, okay, like yeah. scars, you know. But I think you're example. basically just saying that we don't have all the evolutionary implementation details yet. And so we can't explain how those details connect to high level philosophy concepts yeah yeah 
Um, yeah, so in the same way that like finding genes and the 50 year process that we went through from that to um, uh, mapping the human genome, um, like that process has, you know, opened up huge, uh, like, uh, I get, I don't even really know what to call them, um, areas of research, uh, explanations, um, uh, different stuff, technologies, ideas, whatever else. Um, that's what I think, just listening to the first chapter, that's sort of my um, low confidence prediction for when AGI will happen, is that this is, uh, in essence, like necessary and sufficient. Um, in the same way that like to properly understand genes, you need to understand uh, like the chemistry of things and the idea of like, uh, you know, being red to produce proteins and stuff like that. And from there, um, there's a lot more uh, like we can we can, you know, we've done stuff like create uh, new base, new bases for genes, like a different not GATC. Um, so there's two more. I think. No, is it just those? Anyway. BCAT. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so some scientists were like, are there other things we could add to this alphabet? Um, and they found some other stuff and they worked like they produced different proteins. Um, presumably there's no need to produce those proteins or that they could be produced in other ways um, because of the universality of DNA. But, um, uh, but yeah, but like that level of, of control where, you know, there's still huge, huge amounts to learn. Um, but without doing that, we couldn't, for example, like create artificial life or something like that, um, an artificial genome. Um, and whereas with AGI, yeah. I think that's the, that's the, the thing. Yeah, my basic opinion is epistemology has to be developed more and people are wrong to jump ahead and try to work on AGI or like the details of how ideas evolve, like implementation details. We're, we're not ready for that yet. Epistemology is like CR gives us sort of a loose outline and there's a lot left to fill in and flesh out within that yep. framework. And it just hasn't been done yet and people are sort of acting like epistemology is good enough or solved or they're just still inductivists and um, it's ineffective. And so I think that uh, like the yes no stuff and breakpoints and needing binary for error correction and so on are like fruitful avenues and stuff like that has to be developed or you can expect to reach whatever comes next. Yep. Yep. I agree. I think epistemology is a bottleneck. Evolution we've got a lot of different knowledge about. Um, yeah. Like we can implement evolutionary algorithms in new things that no one ever has, has ever told us how to do that before um, pretty easily. Like there's thousands of scientists or programmers or whatever that could do that. Um, well, those algorithms in general don't actually do evolution. They're just misnamed. So this is like an interesting, so I, I roughly agree in that there's, uh, but I also don't think that everything that we call evolutionary algorithms are in that category. Um, as in sometimes we, so for example, the evolutionary algorithm that, um, uh, I mentioned for this route finding thing, this would be one of the evolutionary algorithms that I don't think is a real thing. Um, uh, whether it's doing like evolution or not, it's like, it's pretty, pretty tenuous. So, uh, ignore the elitism stuff, but this generate new population is where the magic happens. Um, and in essence, it's uh like mixing up different parts uh, you can ignore this thing as well that like iipc that just gets carried through it's um to tell whether a, a, a move is valid yeah. or not um the important uh, thing here is that there's a intelligent designer who's using their intelligence to guide what happens and the computer is just doing the grunt work and carrying out their plan rather than creating knowledge of its own that, like the designer didn't create um yeah, so stuff like including the A star algorithm, for example, um, like the distance, the heuristics and stuff that we use, um, that's why you predominantly like think it's not, or that things aren't evolutionary algs? Well, the entire design of the program, like you figured everything out, oh, yeah, you yeah. figured out the method, you decided like what points or selection effects or whatever are given for what, it's all under your control and you fine tune it to get the result you want. Yes, yep. And like choose initial conditions or like load stuff in yeah, or Yeah. Um 
so um there's a so I haven't I haven't thought too much about that this and before, it, but I've it's basically just a math problem that you're trying to put in and that you want a solution to, rather than a a, a creativity yes. problem. Um, yeah. So I think like the unbounded nature of evolution in that, uh, like replication is the only real thing that something needs to do, and then there's no constraints on how they grow or what they become or anything else. Um, in terms of a system. Uh, that's all like environmental. Um, uh, I guess the the core sort of conflict at the moment in my mind is uh, just a raw simulation of stuff. Like simply specifying a system isn't enough to make something not evolution uh, in the sense that we could like just try and model physics and end up you know, having life evolve in this, you know, simulated thing. Um, I think that could still be reasonably called evolution. Um, I don't think there's huge, like, there's no goal. Can you simulate, like, a complex, approximately autonomous world? Sure. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure where the boundary is then between that and what we call like evolutionary algorithms in general. Um, the heuristic is a problem. Um, the choice of alphabet is a problem. Yeah, but... there are a lot of issues. Um, I think understanding epistemology better will, will help a lot with that. Mm. Yeah, okay. But you um... have to figure out like where the knowledge is coming from and what knowledge is actually present. And yeah. is... Is the evolutionary system like sufficiently complex and autonomous to have like major emergent properties? Possibly a jump to some sort of universality is required. Some sort of breakpoint has to be crossed where it's doing things that are separate than the design of it. It has to be like similar to how you have a like very weak computer system and you add a new feature and now you have a universal computer, it got really powerful. Um you have to have like a sort of generic evolutionary thing and you add new features and then it gets really powerful in some sort of big discontinuous jump and then it's doing stuff on its own that wasn't just you deciding what happens. Something roughly like that. But um, you know, we, we could explain that better if, if uh, epistemology was more nailed down. Yeah, so um, two things that sort of occurred to me. So like making an AGI for example, presumably, like we have a, a way of knowing that. I guess um, the se like uh, you had a phrase in there, something like separate to design, um, or separate from the design of it. Um, and I feel like there's one of the caveats is to do with the level of emergence on which the design is happening. Like you could design an alphabet for genes and allow evolution to work from there, but if you design an alphabet for like an algorithm that already includes all the moves that you can possibly make, then you're not really doing evolution. Like you, you've you've done the design in terms of the outcome, as opposed to genes have nothing about the outcome in their design. Um, that's like there's at l like there's multiple. Uh, well, I don't know. There's layers of abstraction between them, um, mm -hmm. uh, such that you can't make a case for either layer with in terms of the other um or if you do it's really 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 roundabout and doesn't include all the information anyway similar to the you know copper atom on churchill's nose type thing um yeah um this one the doing stuff that we didn't like decide as in or like whatever else like that that happens a lot in sufficiently complex agi um not agi sorry um machine learning stuff uh already um there's like they figure out Tricks. I don't think it does nearly as much as as people think. Oh, I think, I think they're I think... overhyping it. But yeah. Yeah. Um, but there is like, yeah. Um, like stuff figuring out how to like walk upside down to meet arbitrary challenges or whatever else that, um, they didn't foresee. Yeah, well, yeah. People it... people get surprised in ways like that, but they they set up the rules to enable. Yes. That, like, people often talk about rules and don't think through the consequences, like, um, 
Like whoever made the rules of chess, for example, didn't think through what all the results would be. And there's something interesting there. But it's the knowledge is still coming from the designers of the game, even if they didn't foresee everything. Same with like Smash Melee with wave dashing. That was uh, an accident. Oh, I'm not familiar with the mechanic, but players figured out to do, how to do a thing that wasn't... Or like BLJs yeah. in Mario, like backwards long jumps. Yeah, yeah that, that's another one. That, was, that one was definitely very unintended. With the forward speed cap, but not the backward speed cap. Yes, yeah. Um, I think people see a lot of stuff. Like they'll, you know... Uh, AI researcher will set up rules, uh, and they will actually go to like effort to disallow certain things. They'll try and design it so that it can't be broken in certain ways or whatever, which I think is a big hint that there's not nearly as much epistemic value there as people attribute. Um, but then they get surprised when it does something like uh, figures out that you know if it moves really really fast, it like glitches the physics in the game to like you know warp something or like clip something through something else or like so that it can grab hold of something without having to open its pincery things or yeah, yeah. whatever else. People think it's creating all this knowledge because it wasn't explicitly known by the creator when they were putting it in. Um, right, the creator just gave a search strategy and then it did all the grunt work. Um, it's I think like it's if, you, if you tell something to like dig holes throughout the desert and then it finds a treasure chest and you're like, I had no idea there was a treasure chest there. It's like yeah, yeah, but you told it to go dig a bunch of holes. Um, I don't. It, it didn't create the knowledge. It just did the grunt work. And uh, yeah, I think most people will intuitively uh, uh, agree that you own the treasure, not the machine. Right. And when you told it to go dig holes, you had an idea that it might find something interesting at some point. And when yeah, you programmed that... it to take photos of the holes, and if uh, there's anything other than sand, like report back so a human can check. Um, yeah, and it's the same with getting their AGIs to do something else that seems notable. Like they set up the domain, they had an idea of what would be notable in advance, etc. Uh, yeah, to be like specifying the encoding for thoughts. Um, yeah, and these these people are um, very bad at reporting back what they did, and they don't understand like what the issues are and what counts as cheating and stuff. So they can like cheat and lie about it without realizing they did anything because they don't actually know what cheating is or what information is important. They so get like very unreliable and, and bad reports about what they did and what the results yep. were. Yep. Um, no, I think as well, like particularly in machine learning stuff, the other people uh, in the field don't know how to spot that. Um, well, just in general, there's a lack of like epistemic seriousness, I guess from that field which is a shame yeah um, i've been watching some of their tweets about gpt3 and they're all ridiculous and have no clue what's going on um oh is in there like praising it for like nearly being sentient or something like that yeah um, i mean not quite that bad but a little in that direction and they're just saying things that are wrong um i agree that like it's one of those things where i think people need to be able to like say i agree that these are like curious and weird and confusing like outcomes um but this in no way has any like it doesn't give us a reason to believe that there's anything special going on here i mean with gpt3 there's 175 billion parameters um which is just a massive 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 search space like you couldn't try and understand what's going on in that thing even if you had a way to analyze it without like some incredibly powerful new explanation um yeah and they just have massive, massive amounts of human-created data, which it then stitches together. And then you get things yeah. that are like interesting to humans, that humans wrote all the pieces of. Um, it's like people seeing meaning in like Markov chains, which is, in essence, the same sort of thing. Um, it doesn't matter if a good short story comes out. That short story is, like, it's, the knowledge is embedded in the input material, and then you're doing creative work to try and figure out what the story means as well at the end. Um, None of that was involved in the actual uh, algorithm yeah, itself. Yeah, people find meaning in Rorschach ink blots. Yeah. Oh. So. Um. Anyway, yeah. So 
That's what I and meant by that. And they attribute, like, complex personalities okay. to their pets as well, for example. Oh, yeah. Um, and they're It's sort of funny. Um, I think pets are hard enough to understand with a simple model, um, partially because they there's no, like, way to sync up what they're, uh, like, what, they're, what they naturally learn as such. Um, so, like, my cat, for example, will meow near the front door, I think because I've reacted more when she's there, so she knows that she can, like, get food better that way. Um, knows. Um, it's not even like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, like, animals being simple is hard enough to figure out what's going on. We don't need to, you know, think that they can, you know, be passive-aggressive at us at the same time or something like that. Um, anyway, yeah, most of the notes that I took here are like stuff like the privileged position with regards to explanation. That was just like a good phrase that I uh, thought I wanted to remember. Um, crucial experimental test is a way to describe the difference between explanations or like finding that difference, stuff like that. I'm not sure there was... Um, one of the things that he says that I found somewhat interesting uh, and conflicting a little bit with what I thought. Um, so he talks about like, he, th he says that he thinks that the unification of our fundamental theories and a shift towards a theory of everything is already underway, which I can sort of agree with, but I don't know if that if there's like an element of contradicting the idea of a beginning of infinity there. Um, I mean, it's it's not that like he he points out that there's not a it's not an end like like just having a theory of everything does not mean that this is not going to continue to develop and evolve and stuff. Um, the reason that I thought there might be a conflict is that it sounds like uh, that infinity is n maybe different to uh, the idea of like coming up with the explanations, the found like the fundamental theories in the first place. I guess I don't know. I'm not quite sure, even if I can explain it particularly well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I wouldn't get hung up on stuff like that. I don't think that's one of the like really important, useful concepts it seems more yeah. like a, a sophisticated speculation which has less practical value it's not the kind of thing you want to like practice and learn it and reuse it a bunch it's more yeah. like once you learn all the basics then you can try to analyze that kind of tricky conclusion and, and think about it and ponder alternatives and so on um i agree that it doesn't really have any significance for as far as I can tell, I don't think there's particularly any significance for BOI or fabric or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't have like um tool status. It's not an intellectual yes, yeah. tool. It's yeah. Same with qualia, by the way. Um, I think pretty much everything people say about them is terrible and just makes them more confused, and that they should just stop talking about them pretty much. Um, I definitely like the times where I've heard the word qualia used on less wrong. Um, I don't think it's even consistent with the, the basic definition you get from Google. Um, I don't know. I mean, sensation is sort of the only other word that I could think of to use for it, though, so I'm not sure. Not that I talk about them often enough to really worry about trying to find an alternative, but... Yeah, I think um, sensation is a much better word. Yeah. The um, This question was just about the idea that... Uh, like, the frogs in different parallel universes... Um, I mean, I don't really know what I was thinking writing this, because I think that they're just as real as us. Um, yeah, so regardless no... of universe, is the wrong way to think about it. There's no preferred basis of which universe is, like, uh, the realer one, or whatever. Yeah, no privileged position. Um, yeah. I think maybe I took this note down just because, uh, because of the, you know, shadow sensation idea or whatever else that's in there. Um, that qualia felt somehow like different, or like philosophy and ideas and stuff like that were like able to hold a different realness sort of thing or something or other, but that doesn't make any sense, and I don't know what more real would be. Um, they're all just real in the same way. Yeah. About light bending, um, what about bending in materials like water or diamond or something? Oh, yeah. Um, as in, uh, like a, a, a boundary interface thing. Um, uh, I'm not sure why that happens. 
Um, I'm also not sure if uh, it so. I don't know. There's sort of like, in some ways, I sort of feel like is the bending a bit of an, an illusion, but isn't wouldn't that just be the same as like general relativity? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Oh. Otherwise, no. Yeah, I mean, it's not that it exactly bends; it's that it goes slower or gets refracted or something. And then, relative to the light that doesn't go through the water, it comes out looking weird because it's taken a different path. But it's not that it took a curved path, maybe, so it might not be bending in the way you mean it. Yeah, I, that's I think. Yeah, that's sort of what I was trying to get at just then. In that it's like both the yeah the speed and direction change. But the, right. I mean, the direction only changes. It might from still outside. be going in straight lines, but then it ends up looking weird to our eyes because we're getting light that is sort of out of sync with the other photons in the way that we're used to things being in sync. I'm definitely not an expert on this stuff, though. Yeah, um, I think the issue might come from like the the image of the the thing in the top right of the browser there. Um, I think it's sort of good um, as a uh, like the. The reason it sort of looked like that is because we're looking at it from we've we've introduced an artificial perspective in order to show this thing, um, like uh, yeah, it's not like um, with with like uh, really like with uh, general relativity bending, um, you actually I don't know I don't know enough about it either. Um, I'm not sure it's worth thinking about. It's pretty basic as an idea or pretty um. Basic is not the right word. Inconsequential, maybe. Yeah, it's it's not too important to your current goals, I think. Yeah, um, I don't think there's really much more to say about the what do you call it, the notes. Um, okay, so I saw this meta discussion one. Um, this looked interesting. What did you have in mind by this, or? Like, do you know why people object to meta discussion in general? I have, I have some idea. Um, the thing to mention first, maybe, is because I don't think I've written many posts like this. Um, you remember the post that we, or the sort of thing that we practiced, where we were answering a question like, "What would it mean if, uh, like, gender differences were entirely socially constructed?" I think it was a title like that. Um, oh yeah. So that's the that's the sort of um context with which I wrote this one, as in like, what would it mean if meta discussion was bad? Um, and then going through sort of the consequences of that and particularly looking to get to trying to be, answer this question, is it compatible with fallibilism? Um, this is like two things is like, you could interpret that to mean, is it meta discussion um, compatible or like, is meta discussion being bad a compatible idea? Um, anyway, so I think I know some of the reasons. Um, uh, like off-topic distraction, uh, introducing stuff like ad hominem, um, un like I think ironically enough, like unbounded, uh, like direction for a subtree essentially is like one reason people don't like it. Um, yes. um yeah, I mean, I personally, yeah, th those are common like, reasons. Um, yeah, I think I agree with you. Um, I think, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, I think yeah. there's. I've tried one... going like super not meta before, and people can take it really, really badly. They read between the lines, and then you ignore everything they say about reading between the lines and focus on the topic, and then they read between the lines more, and you never like contradict them or engage with it. And it just gets worse. Yeah. Um... And they they feel like ignored because you are ignoring a lot of what they say. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it sort of makes sense if, um, yeah, if, if there's like a, a, a topic that needs to be resolved first, then you are going to like almost necessarily ignore, um, the other yeah. stuff. None of the anti-meta people ever have a consistent definition of what they think is meta and then they want to exclude. Like they're all in favor of some meta. It's never a, a hard limit. Yes, yeah. Um, well, I think it's one of these things where um, oh, I can't find the thing, but there was there was in the TCS FAQ there was like a question uh, which didn't have a link to the actual rules, but was 
like why do we disallow meta discussion? Um, uh, that's by the way, that's just under your browser on the other side of my screen. I'll move it over here. Just to, um, I was just searching for that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, so unlike there was something that I wrote here actually. Um, oh yeah, so. Um, a lot of what yeah. people want in discussions is to talk about a specific topic and to keep the discussion narrow and non-threatening. And meta discussion makes discussions sometimes become threatening. It gets the, the discussion out of the limited boundaries of what they were planning to talk about. Like they summoned up the courage to talk about like a specific limited thing and then if it gets out of control they're scared and, and bad things start happening. Um. Yep. However, the people are fundamentally dishonest and are unwilling to state, I want a narrow discussion, here are the topic boundaries, that's all I'm up for. You know, if they won't say that, um, so they, they want like hidden unwritten rules like no meta to help cause that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh man, maybe I shouldn't have made that comment about the keyboard earlier. Um, yeah, no, I agree. Um, the thing that I was just thinking about, so remember some time ago, I think I brought up this argument against moral relativism that I'd started saying, um, and I think it was either inspired by something in BOI or possibly just in Fabric because it was, what, three plus years ago I read the first few chapters. Um, but yeah, there's like this short argument about logical positivism um and uh basically right. like that it says it's me it says itself is meaningless yes yeah and anyway i like adapted this into moral relativism in that moral relativism says no objective moral truth but that isn't in of itself a moral statement and then your reply was i'm not sure if it's a moral statement which has made me think about it and i haven't said it since um uh but yeah but the meta thing is like pretend, like the same sort of thing in that like conversations about meta or talking about meta is meta um if you disallow meta then you shouldn't tell people that you disallow meta sort of thing um i think that's like a really fundamental yeah. contradiction they, they cheat in a way though because they um they separate all the discussions into separate silos like discussion a discussion b and then each one gets to have a main topic and discussion b's main topic can be why is meta discussion bad and then that becomes an object topic so like the rule against meta discussion in a way allows all discussions if you start with them you're just not allowed to branch discussions to the other discussions you have to keep them siloed and, and have your meta discussion as a independent separate discussion so i can sort of see people being like not thinking as much of a contradiction if they say that meta discussion is like allowed in like when it's the object topic of a, a thing um if they argued against branching off though, like in the same way that on FI we, you know, like starting your topic and put was for the previous subject. Um, like if that was a rule, that just seems ridiculous. Like a rule, like if you're going to start talking about meta stuff, start a new topic, like branch off and use was, something like that is way less harmful than you can't have meta topics about object topics that have existed yeah. outside that no so, so their idea is that if you're going to talk about principles like discussion methodology you have to disconnect them from any actual discussions so you can't use a discussion you're just having as an example and talk about how the other guy had a discussion methodology problem that's getting in the way of the discussion uh, you can just start a separate topic uh, hopefully at a later date so it doesn't seem like it's you know implicitly between the lines connected you just like wait a month and then you start a topic about in general how should we do discussions and what methods should we use and then you don't relate it to your example and then it's okay or something you can have yeah, like sort it, of the same discussion you just can't connect it to the the practical consequences because that would hurt people's feelings yeah um and i know we've, we've talked a bit about this with regards to less wrong um it occurs to me though that this is sort of like a scientist trying to figure out the laws of physics and not have any experiments in the real world. Like you're not allowed to link it to real world stuff. You've got to use hypothetical universes or whatever else, um, which just, you know, sounds like you'd end up with string theory and not anything useful. 
Yeah, um, I think you're allowed to use real examples from people who aren't present, like public figures and third parties sometimes. But like the rules aren't, they're a little weird because like, you know, if you use someone as an example and then they join the forum, um, you know, you're... Is it now okay? Is it they're sort of okay? relying on these arbitrary silos where a certain person is not part of the discussion, so you're allowed to talk about them, but if someone isn't part of the discussion, you aren't allowed to talk about them, even if they're a public figure, and who knows. Well, so it seems like the that might come from the concept of like talking behind someone's back, um, sort of roughly speaking. Yeah, but the speaking, rule here like, is you I, can only talk behind their back? Yep, yeah, I mean, only if they don't find out, and they're not in the room, but if they do come back in the room, then you're not allowed to anymore. Um, I mean, it, there's... Questions like, what about members who used to be part of the discussion forum but aren't anymore? Are you allowed to talk about them? Um, are you only allowed to talk once they leave? Do they have to explicitly leave? Um, public figures and stuff, what if they get interested in philosophy and, like, come over? Is this now, should we stop having a conversation that's halfway through? Should, like, yeah, I think there's, like, a lot of obvious issues there. Um, inconsistencies within the, like, unwritten rules, particularly. Yeah, yeah a, a lot of what the meta discussion rule meant in practice in the TCS community, and I think many others, was a very vague, generic rule to hide social norms under. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to um to enforce all the social norms you want to under rules like be polite. Um, that doesn't give you enough leeway to like ban enough things. So they need like some other rule to let them use their intuitions about what's okay or not. Yep. I agree that it only makes, um, like as in, uh, or I think we agree on the idea that uh, social norms are better when they're all explicit and the explicit, <laughs> explicitly written down stuff like covers the complete totality of it. And if something's outside that, like outside the um, either allowed, disallowed or whatever in social norms, then uh, you can't like it's it's unfair to you know punish someone for that if it's not explicitly like mentioned as something that's bad. Categories are okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, so the anti-meta stuff seems like the logical positivism positivism thing. Uh, this question, I think no one has any idea. I mean, probably not, first of all. But just the concept of finding new universalities is not understood well at all. And like, how do you know which universalities are important? We really just have like a few examples and some loose intuition. Yeah. And David um, hasn't really tried to talk about or explore it. Um, David's, what David's published is actually misleading because he selectively talks about certain, like, a handful of notable universalities, rather than saying what generically is a universality and why do these ones stand out for discussion. Um, he he didn't even take it that far. He just talked about some of them and said they were important. Yeah, Which is, so like uh, it's a starting point, but it doesn't get you into understanding, uh, like how you find them and which ones matter and so. On. Um, a thing that occurs to me. So like um, I remember we talked about uh. I asked, or I had written at some point, do some goals have reach? Um, so, we, you know, it seems pretty reasonable that uh, not dying is a universal goal among... Uh, actually, is this, does this have any universality? I don't know. Um, maybe not. Anyway, it's a goal that's shared by, like, all living things. Um, People it's call not... themselves, though. Oh, that's true. Yep, no, strike that. Um Yeah. Um, about okay. universalities, though, I think there's a more generic concept, which is breakpoints. I think universalities are one type of breakpoint. Um, a jump to universality is a discontinuity. I don't think it's the only discontinuity that you can find. Yeah. But I, I think breakpoints are fundamentally important because they're what turn things digital instead of analog, which is required for error correction. So when you're trying to correct errors, instead of 
uh, you know, we measured a value on the real number line, and the real value is somewhere on the real number line, and uh, we have no idea where it is. You know, we just hope we're close. Uh, when you look at uh, something in terms of a few breakpoints, then you have these discrete, distinguishable ca uh, categories that have noticeably different characteristics, and that lets you um, actually check if your like measurement is in the right category and it makes sense and like lets you. Yeah, it gives you better ways to double check whether you're right. Very similar to um, when a computer component gets a signal and it rounds it to zero or one because all the values in the middle are wrong. Yeah. Um, just thinking about this in regards to some other stuff, um, but I'll do that after after our session. Um, one thing I was thinking is maybe since we're close to the thing, um, and uh, whether I should like or we, whether we should yeah talk about this list and potentially any that I should focus on before the next one um, that would be like particularly like as in I mean I guess one of the main things is ruling out stuff that is anything else. Um, yeah, I don't I know. Think this one is like, interesting about why someone should take you seriously. Um, and partly the question is, what is taking someone seriously? Yes, yeah. What do you um, mean by that? So, yeah, I think that one would be interesting to write about. That's something I've been thinking a lot, sort of in general, about... Uh, Picking fights, I think, is good, too, as a topic. Yeah, so this is a thing that I do occasionally. Um, sometimes... Or oh, I think sometimes justly, but definitely sometimes unjustly. Um, I've been considering it more and more lately. There are benefits to it in the sense that you get practice in things, and you can practice things that you wouldn't be able to easily practice otherwise. Um, if you're like making someone's life worse just so you can get practice in something, that's probably a bit unfair though. Um, but um, but yeah, even like some of it could be like um. Like if you notice that someone in your, or if you notice something around that's like not complying with like a local, like regulation or something like that, and then you can pick a fight with whoever answers you at like the council um, about whether this is right or wrong, or if you think it's, you know, against regulation, but they don't, there's stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure necessarily if it always provides value or not. Um, there's obviously pointless fights, but yeah, but this is something that is, um, I think, interesting. And yeah, this one I don't like. I don't think this will be very useful. It's partly that it's terminology based. It's partly that it's about um like fancy concepts. It's too far away from working on your intellectual tools. I think. Yeah. Um, that was uh, that was based on something I read by someone where they. Um, or actually, sorry, it was, um, oh, I don't know if it matters, but the reference was like repli like of anti-rational and rational as a replication strategy, uh, which I think conflicts with the idea of the method of replication. But I can see why it sort of makes sense in that the strategy is either to suppress or uh, amplify, like amplify, allow, facilitate um, rational thinking. Um, but it seems, yeah, not particularly like a replication strategy, something a bit more foundational. Yeah, so FI light dialogue sounds like a good idea. I was actually enjoying writing that because particular, I mean, <laughs> sort of funny in that I'm not sure if I'll, how much I'll actually produce out of it, but it was with only a few sentences, I'd like really started to challenge, um, like find parts where I didn't know things. Um, yeah. And it's not hard to come up with like, you know, um, I just imagine what like you or someone else would like respond. Um, uh, because I know like what a, a lot of the responses would be. And so it's, it's just easier to, if you just pretend someone else is going to say them, it doesn't matter if they're right or wrong or like high quality or low quality or whatever else. Um, yeah, yeah. Discussing with your own mental models of people is a good thing to try. Um, 
it's easier to be adversarial with yourself, I guess is the, um, whereas when you try and have like a tribunal type model in your own head, you don't, or it's easier to fool yourself. Um, sort of thing. So, I mean, even just in this, like I got, um, like, what do you call it? This is when I made that note was that, um, like practice is particularly what I was trying to, or like a concept that I was trying to talk about by like whatever idea was in here. Um, and I, and I hadn't made that explicit, like, um, yeah. So it was immediately useful, um, going through the dialogue sort of thing. So I want to finish this. Have we talked about the three stages of practice? where you learn to do it, then you learn to do it repeatedly, and then efficiently? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's, is that in the overreaching article, or it's in one of them? Um, I'm not sure that it is. I don't know where it is. Yeah. Um, I think there's actually like some pretty similar stuff in software design, not particularly about practice, but in terms of like optimization, as in do it at all, fix all the bugs, then worry about optimizing it. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there was something that I thought about software as, was that, that was yesterday? Another version is um, test-driven test -driven development, where you um, write down success and failure criteria in the form of tests first, and then you do it all to the point that it passes the tests, and so on. And you can do the same kind of thing with practice. You can come up with some criteria at the beginning for what actually constitutes success, and that makes it a lot easier to figure out if you've done it successfully or not. Yeah, one thing that I, so I'm actually fairly against test-driven development, but not because the idea is necessarily bad in principle, but because people are really bad at writing the tests and knowing what to write. Um, so it would be uh, like, for example, saying like, I want to be able to catch a ball. So you like only drop a ball from one meter and just practice being able to like not let it hit the ground um, sort of thing. Um, there's some good criticisms of this sort of stuff for the, particularly regards to enterprise programming, where people will like add special cases and things to pass tests. Um, so I think it doesn't work. Oh, that sounds like, horrible. Like, yeah, I don't have a lot of experience with people writing dumb tests. It's um, it's easy to see its usefulness for yourself and like in re in as a metaphor for learning or like in a in regards similar sort of idea because you don't like you don't want to screw yourself over. So whereas with enterprise stuff, people try to do less work. Um, the uh, the solution that people have proposed to like test driven or to that problem, which can still be test driven development, um, but is like property testing. Um, so an example would be like, um, uh, oh, well, I'm just going to do it in Haskell thing. Um, it so helps like, to like auto generate tons of tests or do like tests with randomness on the, or like fuzz testing or something. And it's harder for people with a special case in order to pass. Um, so there's a thing called quick check in Haskell that uh, uses properties you define and generator methods you define on data types to automatically generate uh, like random data or vo from random data like these valid constructions. And then you define yeah. properties. Um, whoops. Uh, so like like this, for example, for reversing a list is that like the concatenation, the reverse of the concatenation of two lists should be same yeah. as yeah the two lists reversed and then concatenated. Um, and you can't fool this. Like when you do stuff like this, you can't like stupid uh, slash clever enterprise programmers can't fool this with special cases or things like that, um, because you often you only need like four properties, and then you completely isn't, define isn't this wrong? Um, yes, sorry. Um, I should probably do this. Um, that I think is better. Yeah, so we'll have the end of y first, and we'll have the start of x at the end. Yeah, that seems right now. Yep. So one of the great things about this sort of testing thing, though, is that I immediately would have, like, as soon as I try and run this through quick check, like, nothing could have satisfied this thing if I had a half-decent reverse algorithm. Um, like, empty list, that's like a special case, maybe. 
with one yeah. of empty. So you, you make the tests less parochial, and then you have a lot less trouble with people doing parochial stuff to pass them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, you can also right. do a We're... decent job with um, parochial tests plus honor system coders who try not to do parochial things. And then if you're not um, customizing your code to the tests at all, then parochial tests do a decent job, even though they're not perfect. Yep. I, but particularly if you put effort into thinking, like, how to cover the cases. Um, yeah. Okay, um, we're close to the, well, we're at the hour. Yeah. Um, is there anything you reckon we should, anything before finishing up? Um, no, so just for next time, we had a few that you could write about, and I think it would be good for you to do something about uh, what your goals are and like how attainable you think they are, just like kind of taking stock of your life a bit. Um, like what do you what do you plan to do? What do you think you can actually accomplish? How do you plan to do it? And you know, are you in a good position to do it and, and stuff like that? I think that kind of yep. big picture stuff is sometimes neglected, so worth taking a look. Yep. Um I have been starting to think about that with um yeah, the idea of doing like a bigger retrospective on this these last few months. Um to make up for not having done learning reports and things. Uh and make sure I get some of that down. But um no particular future stuff would be good. All right. Um so we're uh next session's on Friday, right? Yeah, four days. Yep. Yes, yep, four days. Cool. Okay. All right, see you then. Bye.